Hello everyone. After having just finished The Fall, I wanted to come back and do a review on it. So this game is a sci-fi side-scrolling action adventure made by Over the Moon. My overall impressions of it is that it's got some problems, but I really love it despite those problems. So let me go ahead and get into a new game here to show you the beginning section. And while I'm doing that, I just want to mention that the first part of this review will be light on any spoilers. And towards the end, I'm going to get into some more spoiler territory, but I'll warn you in advance. Biomonitor inoperable. Pilot unresponsive. Life support functioning. Basic Mark 7 system access routed to ARID AI. Primary objective save my pilot. <laughs> Accessing on-suit logs. Mission parameters and location data not found. Look around with the right mouse, examine two points to continue. Alright, so I'll read these points properly later, but let's just continue for now. Threat level unknown. Weapon rendered inoperable from the impact. Consulting parameters. I will locate medical facilities. Alright, so here we go. It's one hell of an opening, isn't it? I really love the opening. You literally just crash land into a planet. You were falling through space for some reason, you don't know why. That's left up as a mystery. And you crash land here. And your objective is to save the pilot that is inside of your suit. So you're an AI. You're an artificial intelligence. You're Arid, who is controlling the combat suit. And the pilot inside of you is unresponsive. So you're trying to save them. And if you take a look at your operating param parameters. Load this up here. It's got all this cool like scan line interface, very cool. Here's all the functions of my suit. My antimatter shielding is the only thing that actually is properly working. That's what I enable to survive the impact. And the health monitor is damaged, which is why I can't actually figure out what the hell is going on with the pilot inside of the suit. I just know that since they're not responding, I probably need to do something to save them. They're probably not doing too great. And everything else is restricted. It's one hell of an opening and I really love it. Alright, so let's talk a little bit about controls first. You can use a mouse and keyboard, which is what I'm using, or you could also use a controller. And I actually, when I first played this, I ended up flip-flopping between the two. I couldn't quite decide for a while which one I wanted. And that's because there's some weird... There's some weirdness to the controls. There's a little bit of weirdness. I feel like this game is probably better designed in general for a controller. Because here's how it works right now. For the movement of your character, it's pretty standard. WASD. To move back and forth. Space to jump. And stuff like that. But when it comes to looking around... What you have to do to bring out your weapon is to hold down the right mouse button. That brings it out. And then you move your mouse around like this, to look around. I know it's kind of awkward that it keeps uh, switching to the left and then the right of the character. That always disorientated me throughout the entire game. But uh, anyway. So you move your mouse around to look around, but the problem is that's obviously something better suited to an analog stick, doing this. Because you don't have a crosshair and you don't know how close your mouse actually is to your character. So if you move your mouse to the left and right, it's going to swap directions, but you don't know how close the cursor is to the character because you can't see it. It's obviously designed for an analog stick. So I switched over to a controller, 
But the problem with that is that you're... I mean, I have a gun here. At some point, you're actually expected to shoot things. There is some combat. And aiming with the controller was not nearly as good as with the mouse. Just because, well, a mouse is obviously better at that, but... Um, also because I found the controller to be... Uh, it was too sensitive. Like, the movement for moving your view around was too sensitive with the controller, and unfortunately... You actually can't seem to change that. Okay, there's... Practically no options in the menu if you go... If you go into the options... Um, in game like this, there's almost none of them. You can't access more if you're actually in the main menu and not in a game, but you still can't actually change the sensitivity. So I ended up switching back to keyboard and mouse. It's a little bit awkward, but at least my aiming's better. So that's a bit strange. Now let's look around. Let's look at uh, look at what's going on with the game, and the gameplay, and the writing and stuff like that. So let's examine stuff. So the examine system works like this: you just point at uh, a point of interest. Hold it there for just a brief period of time, and then some text pops up describing what you're looking at, so... The tunnel created from my impact. I can see stars in the distance. I am approximately 50 meters below the surface. A trail of blood and broken glass. Something was dragged through here. So, pretty simple system. Works pretty well. Let's move on. It's, uh... I really like the art style, too. It actually reminds me quite a bit of Limbo. And that the surfaces you're walking on and stuff like that are very dark, nearly completely black. But then the background's lighter to contrast against that. Small, bioluminescent insects. A large pile of damaged and destroyed synthetics. Some of these power systems are still giving off minute electrical signals. A smaller pile of damaged synthetics. Many of these have been smashed beyond recognition. <laughs> yes, there's someone watching me. A robotic arm. The gripping mechanism is still operable. So I really like the atmospherics of it. It's dark. It's creepy. It's very creepy. There's all this stuff just falling through the, the air. Like massive amounts of dust and dirt and grime and it's just dark and it's hard to see and ironically enough your flashlight despite being a flashlight really doesn't allow you to see very much at all as you can see it, it barely helps really I feel like the flashlight is mostly just to show you where you're aiming rather than to actually illuminate anything in the environment so let's show you some of the gameplay um, let's see I should probably go the other way yeah, let's go ahead and go the other way. So there is a heavy adventure game element to this. You're going to be picking up objects. You're going to be putting them in your inventory, and you're going to be using them on stuff. The control panel for this elevator it does not require a key. So here's how you use stuff. It's a little bit strange. At least on mouse and keyboard, you hold down left shift. And that opens up the action menu. And then while still holding down left shift, you use WASD to move around the options. So, hold down left shift, and then press D to move over to interact, and then you release left shift to perform whatever action you have selected. It's a little bit weird. It works. It works fine. But it's a little bit strange feeling to have to hold down shift and then move around with WASD and then release shift. It's a bit strange. Oh, well, there he was in the background watching me again. An old metal pan, empty and relatively clean. Let's go ahead and pick that up. Actually, you know what? I didn't even need to come this way. Whoops. Not yet, anyway. You don't need that pan for a little while. Oh well, it's perfectly fine. So the controls definitely seem better suited to a controller. This game is perfectly playable with either a controller or mouse and keyboard. It's definitely better suited to a controller, though. Mostly because of the... Mostly because of the looking around controls, I feel. And also the shift thing. I mean, the controls for interacting with stuff on a controller is pretty much the same as, as it is on mouse and keyboard. Instead of holding down left shift, you hold down, I think it's right bumper? Yeah, I think you hold down right bumper. 
and then you use the left analog stick to move around the options, and then you release the right bumper to perform that action, so it's pretty much the same. Same sort of idea. However, I feel like it just feels a bit weird, and it's a bit unnecessary with keyboard and mouse, because with keyboard and mouse, you're used to having an actual curse. Like, you're used to aiming, I'm used to aiming at a specific part of the screen, not just aiming in a direction, as this is. You know, I'm used to having a crosshair or a cursor of some kind. I feel like what would have been better... Let's grab this wrench, by the way. I feel like what would have been better, what would have been more comfortable for me for mouse and keyboard controls specifically, is if instead of just looking in a direction like this, and that's all you can see, is I would have liked to see it, to see you actually have a cursor of some sort. You know, a, an aiming dot, a crosshair, whatever. Just something so that you're actually aiming at a specific part of the screen, not just in a direction. And that would take care of two problems. If you had an actual cursor and you could see how close it is to your character, one thing it would allow you to do is instead of using the left shift system to perform an action on whatever you happen to be aiming at, you could instead actually click on an object. So you could like left click on an object and then, you know, select an item in your inventory and use it on it. So that'd be a more traditional point and click interface. You click on something you want to mess with and then you select, you know, an option of what you want to do or you drag an item onto it, that sort of a thing. I feel like that would have been more comfortable, and it also would have solved the issue of the weirdness of not knowing how close your cursor is to your character, which makes uh, turning around like this awkward, because I'm just, like, I move my cursor closer to the character, but I don't know where it is, so I don't know when he's gonna... I don't know when you're gonna look the other way. It's kind of weird. So I feel like that would have solved both the problems. So controls are a little bit weird, but they work perfectly fine, and it's perfectly playable on either a keyboard and mouse or a controller. This cloaking pattern is similar to my own. I may be able to network with it. Let's give that a try. Network interface I disabled. Access to my networking suite. Attempting internal activation. Alright, press escape to check your operating parameters. Alright, let's try to enable it. We were already looking at this earlier. Let's look at it again. Alright, check your network interface. So let's look at the network interface. Access restricted. An organic superior officer is required to permit access. Automatic override will occur if the subsystem is required to prevent pilot death. And that's the key, the automatic override. Subsystem access requires authorization, but I may need these systems to safeguard my pilot. If I could find a way to bypass the lockout, I could override the access protocols myself. <laughs> you see the little screen shift where it just, like, it went all weird for a second? That's where some interesting elements from this game come in. Some of the most interesting elements, I think. One of my favorite things about this game is how it involves the, sort of, the laws of robotics. They're not Isaac Asimov's laws of robotics, but they're a similar thing. You have operating parameters. If you look back in here, look at the bottom. Operating parameters must not misrepresent reality. In other words, don't lie. Must be obedient. Must protect active pilot. So you have certain things that you, as an AI, you need to uphold, but this game really deals with the conflict between them. For example, must not misrepresent reality, don't lie, and must protect active pilot. Well, what if you need to lie to protect your active pilot? Now you have two operating parameters that are in conflict. And that sort of thing comes up very often. It's one of the key things about this game, one of the key kind of story elements. And that's what that shift of the screen was and everything going weird. It's your AI going like, what the hell do I do with this? I don't, I can't, I can't reconcile these things. It's very cool. A steady drip of blood. Yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty grim game. Certainly not a game to play if you uh, want to feel happy. <laughs> it's not a cheerful tale. Alright, so up here, we have a security panel, its power cell is burned out. We've got a uh, security cam here. So, this will spoil the, one of the first puzzles, of course, but it's one of the first puzzles, it's not a big deal. I just want to show you how the puzzle system works, so. Uh, an abandoned security card, I can fit my hand through the bars, but still cannot reach it. So, if you remember all the way to the left, 
Actually, no, I don't think I actually went to it, but all the way to the left, there's a uh, security panel thing where I need to put in a security card, so I need this security card. Of course, I can't actually reach it. So, here's what I need to do. I got a wrench from earlier. Let's go ahead and use that wrench. On. This. Robotic arm, the gripping mechanism, is still operable. So, move down to the micro wrench, use it on it. There we go, I should be able to control the grasp. So that's going to be my extension to grab the security card. There we go. So I actually want to mention something about the puzzles. There is a serious problem with the puzzles in this game. But this is not a great example of one that has a serious problem. This is a great example of one that has a minor problem. I'll just mention this one first, though. So, look at the. This is the thing that fell across. This is the thing that blocks my access. Let's get it back up again. There we go. You can see this thing covers my way and prevents me from moving forwards. If you just look at it visually, just just use your eyes. Don't use any other knowledge that we have. Just look at just look at it. We're looking at it from the side. It looks like it's just solid, right? Because that's all you can see, it's just a solid block. So... If you just use your eyes to look at this obstacle, you have no reason to believe that you can actually... that there's actually gaps in it, that there's bars that you could potentially reach through. It just looks like a completely impassable barrier. The only way you can actually know that you can reach through this is if you read the description here. Well... It did say it. It said there's uh, gaps in the bars here. And that's one of the problems this game kind of has is there's some simple... I'm not sure the right term. There's some readability issues in the environment art. It's a very dark game. It's very hard to see stuff and the flashlight really doesn't illuminate much at all. Again, it's more of a pointing device than something to actually be able to see more of the environment with. So... There's some cases where you just don't know where you can walk or like what you're really looking at and you kind of just have to read the text to figure out what the hell is going on, as is the case here. If you just look at this, it looks like you can't get through it and there's no bars. You can't see them. You have to read the text to figure out that there's bars here. Which is a bit silly, you should be able to just see it, you know? And that's a problem in some other parts of the game. And unfortunately, what that kind of requires you to do is you really have to... You have to, like, sweep your view around everywhere to make sure you don't miss a single thing. You can't miss a hotspot because you basically use these these hotspots to tell what the hell's in the environment. Because you can't really use your eyes to tell what you're looking at. You have to read the descriptions. So you have to, as you're walking along, you kind of have to do like this. Like, did I miss anything? Did I miss anything? Did I miss anything? Anything on the wall? Anything ground? Wall? Ground? Wall? Oh, oh, there's something up there. So you kind of have to sweep your view around like a crazy person. It's a bit strange, and I'd like it if you could... I'd like it if the environment was more... Well... Could be read easier with your eyes, rather than having to just look for hotspots, and then figure out what's in the environment from the hotspots. So let's go ahead and use the security card. And I'll talk a little bit more about, actually probably a lot more about the puzzles a little bit later on, but for now, let's change things up a little bit. Let's go in here. I want to show you a bit of the dialogue. So, let's see some dialogue. Artificial life form. State your primary function. Let's issue a standard greeting. I am the ARID on board this Mark 7 combat suit. My intentions are peaceful. What is your designation? Mark 7 ARID. State your primary function. Negative. Reveal your designation and intention. You are being evaluated for depurposing. State your primary function. I don't want to be depurposed. 
Negative. I will not reveal my directives to an unknown entity. Infraction. Avoidance. Continued infractions will result in failure. Do not attempt depurposing. Hostility will result in full defensive engagement. Irrelevant. State your primary function. My primary function is to assist and protect the human pilot of this armored combat suit. Human occupant, please verify and validate the function of this artificial life form. Impossible. He is unresponsive and likely in critical condition. I must find him medical treatment immediately. Can you be of assistance? Evaluation failed. Unit unable to demonstrate valid primary function. Initializing neural format. No. That will kill my army. Alright, so here we go. Here's where my operating parameters come into conflict and... Well, I'm finally able to update my network interface. Now I can turn it on because pilot death is imminent. Well, I guess I didn't actually... I guess I didn't break any of my operating parameters there, I suppose. But uh, later on, stuff like that will become very important. So let's go ahead and turn on my network interface. Criteria for override has been met. Please activate subsystem immediately. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Alright, in the top right, it looks like I'm going to interface with this thing. Again, it's another case where the environment is so dark that you can't really tell what the hell you're looking at. Like, I don't know what this thing is, really, but uh, there's only one thing you can do with it, so let's go ahead and network with it. There we go. That takes care of that problem. The crane arm with the network interface likely used to remove the remains of failed evaluations. So yeah, so I, I really like the art style. It's dark, it's grim, it's creepy. It has a hell of a lot of atmosphere, but it does have some simple usability, readability, whatever term you want to use, issues. We just can't quite tell what you're looking at. It's got a good feel to it, though. A really good feel. I love it. Yeah, it's meant to remove failed evaluations. And if you notice, this place is filled with a lot of piles of synthetics. Self-evaluation initiated. Pilot exposed to harm while under ARID control. Login recommendation for ARID diagnostic and reformatting upon return to dock. Edit log. Ultimately, pilot was not harmed and ARID networking suite was brought online. The system may be instrumental to ensuring survival. Yeah, Arid is trying to reconcile those things. I failed, but no, I'm actually protecting my pilot, but no, I kind of failed, I put them in danger, but I put them in danger to protect them, it's... yeah. It's really interesting. It's really fascinating. And like I said before, that's one of the most fascinating things about this game is... artificial intelligence. And his attempts to reconcile these different operating directives. I remember I read the... Um, the Isaac Asimov... oh, hello. The Isaac Asimov Robot series of novels, and that's one of the things they touched upon, is the laws of robotics. Obviously, it's very integral to how they operate. And it was really fascinating. I loved it. I just love the sci-fi bent of this and the AI focus. It's very cool. Not often do you see a game that really goes... that really examines the, the issue of artificial intelligence and how they would operate and how they reconcile these different things. It's very cool. Alright, let's see. Alright, I'm going to show combat in just a minute, but the only thing I want to talk about before that is I want to go into more detail about the puzzles. Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate the puzzles because they're a bit later in the game and that'd be too spoilerish, especially since this is a relatively short game. It's about three to four hours, I think. It took me about four. could take somebody quite a bit uh, 
quite a bit less, probably down to three, I suppose, if they're a bit of a faster player. I'm fairly slow paced in my playstyle, so my four hour play was probably fairly long. But it's a fairly short game, so even an hour in is pretty far in, and I don't want to spoil the puzzle. So let me just talk about it. So there's an issue with the puzzles. I will say this. The puzzles are all logical. I mean, you see the one that I just did there. You got... Like, there's an arm in a pile. And it's... It was... Stuck in the pile. I couldn't just take it out. So I had to find a wrench. Then I used the wrench to remove it. And then I used the arm to give me... Uh, more reach to get the key card, and then use the key card on the thing that needed the key card. That makes sense. It's logical. And that puzzle is pretty much fine, aside from the weird issue of not being able to actually see that there's bars through that door thing. Aside from that, it's perfectly fine. And I would say that all the puzzles in this game are logical. All of them are logical. They are internally consistent, and they make sense within the puzzle itself. And here's what I mean by that. The puzzles are internally consistent, and one action kind of naturally leads to the next part of the puzzle. So if you just look at the puzzle itself, they all make sense. However, there's a bigger issue. And that's that if you look at the puzzle in context with the environment and the other options that you have, they don't, they, they often, not always, but often, don't make sense. And what I mean by that is this. Often the solution to something, to a problem, the puzzle that you have to go through involves a lot of steps. A lot of steps. Like, some of them are like 10, 15 plus step puzzles, where you gotta do a bunch of stuff in a bunch of different places to get to the end result. However, there's often a much, much simpler solution, a much more reasonable solution to the puzzle that is pretty blatantly obvious, and yet you can't do that. You have to instead go through this extremely long, many, many, many stepped puzzle to solve it. And again, the puzzle itself is logical within itself. But when you consider the other options you have at your disposal, and the fact that none of them work and you have to do this ridiculously complex option instead of the simple thing that would solve everything very quickly, it becomes very strange, like, why did I have to go through that? It becomes downright silly. In some cases, it's like, it's laughably silly. It's so complex. Like, there's one puzzle that took me a hell of a lot of time to solve, and so many different items used on different items, and so many different things done, and yet the simpler solution was to simply use my gun to shoot something. And that would have solved it just fine. I, I could have just shot it. <laughs> I could have just, like, the the end result of, the end goal of this one puzzle, no spoilers here, but the end result of it was to basically destroy or remove something from the environment. And you go, you do the most ridiculous stuff and so many different steps to remove this thing from the environment when you could have just shot it. And that would have solved the entire problem in, like, two seconds. It becomes really ridiculous. So the puzzles are, are logical within themselves. They make sense within themselves, but when you consider the environment and the other options at your disposal, they become downright ridiculous. Nonetheless, they're not incredibly hard puzzles, even if they are often a bit silly, and I never felt the need to use a walkthrough. I got kind of close sometimes, but I never felt the need to, so I don't find them too annoying. They're just, they're more silly than annoying, to be honest. And that's one of my biggest problems, because uh, this game does have a pretty heavy adventure game element. In fact, I would say that most of what you do is more adventure game than combat. It's got some combat, but the majority of it is adventure game stuff. Manipulating the environment, grabbing objects, and using objects on the environment. So, it's a pretty serious issue, but it's by no means a deal breaker for me. I've experienced much, much worse puzzles. And at least I can say that these are logical which is not something I can say about many other puzzles in different games. Okay, so let's skip ahead to some combat. Alright, here we go, here's some combat. So I'm taking cover behind this thing on the right here. Let's wait for him to go back, and then let's aim, and... There we go. Okay, so this game does have a cover system. You can hide behind stuff like this if, you, uh, if you're using mouse and keyboard, of course. You can press E to hide behind it. You can press space to vault over. 
You can also hide behind the, like this pillar here, for example. Oh, that's the wrong side. Let's hide behind this side. There we go. Let's hide behind here and take cover. Boom. So combat's pretty simple. Obviously, just hold down right click. Uh, you can switch between your flashlight and your laser sight. You can't fire if you have your flashlight out. It's gonna switch to the laser sight. So it's used, used to aim better. You can take cover, hold down right mouse button to look around, hold down left click to charge your shot and then fire. And that's pretty much it for the combat. You know, you want to hit them in the head because it does more damage. That's about it. Let's keep uh, going. So it's all about timing. Combat is really all about timing because they take shots and then they hide. So you want to wait for them to take shots. And then you want to take your gun out. Oh, taking some damage here. Wait, if, wait for them to shoot. Aim, and there we go. So that's pretty much how combat works. It's it's pretty good. I think it's a decent combat. One of the one of my favorite things about it is how um, satisfying the sounds are and the feedback. So the guns the gun shooting sounds great. Like it's this wonderful kind of um, it's got a lot of oomph to it, a lot of power, and it also sounds vaguely kind of space aged. And you got that whole charged shot thing, which is pretty cool. So it sounds awesome. The sound of hitting the robots sounds great. There's some nice feedback, you know, sparks come off of them when you hit them. The combat music's great. So the combat feels pretty good as far as, like, feedback and shooting the weapon. It feels satisfying to shoot things. It's got a pretty good feel to it. Um, the cover system is simple and... It's a bit awkward, to be honest. It's a little bit awkward. Um... Especially these things, like if you get behind this, and you press the, uh, if you try to go to the left, while behind it, it actually doesn't do anything. However, you can get out of cover by pressing the right key, and going to the right. But not to the left. But you can press space to vault over to kind of go to the left. It's a little bit weird. It works fine. Yeah, it's okay, but the funny thing about the, uh, cover system is that it's basically irrelevant. And the reason for that is because if we go back to my operating parameters, you can see here I have a camouflage system, which is, of course, restricted right now. It's not enabled. However, very, very, very soon, as in probably within, what, the next, like, 10 minutes? So pretty much right after you first get into combat, this is when combat is first introduced, right after you first get into combat and after they introduce the cover system, you actually get the camouflage system. And guess what the camouflage system does? It's basically instant cover anywhere without actually being in cover. It functions the same way as cover. You hold down a button, you become camouflaged, you can't move, and people can't shoot you. Like, they can, they'll shoot at you, but it'll just shoot past you. It functions the same as cover, and it means you never need to use cover ever again, so it's really weird. Let's see if there's more combat up here. I think there might be some more robots up here. In fact, yeah, I'm certain there's some more. So I can show a little bit more of the combat. Also, kind of a, another kind of awkward thing about how you control the character and how you... And really just how you navigate the environment is I mentioned that you pretty much need to sweep your... Um, your flashlight over everything to see every single hotspot to make sure you don't mess, um, miss anything. And once you gain the ability to actually shoot with your weapon you can switch between the laser sight and the flashlight. The thing is though, you need the flashlight out to be actually be able to look at the environment. If you have your laser sight out, you can't see any of the hotspots. So you're gonna have to make sure to always switch back to your flashlight when you're moving around. So right after combat, you're gonna have to switch back to the flashlight. Otherwise, you might end up looking around thinking, hey, there's nothing here to look at, but in reality, it's just because you didn't switch to your flashlight. So it's a little bit awkward, and you're going to end up often, especially later in the game, when there's more combat, you're going to end up switching between the two quite a bit. You know, shoot an enemy, oh yeah, I gotta switch back. Shoot an enemy, oh yeah, I gotta switch back. It's kind of weird. Oh, here we go. Yeah, takedowns. There's a takedown system. It's pretty simple. The AI is, well, 
There's not much to it. It's dumb. It doesn't... <laughs> it's blind. It doesn't even see my light. So, you just go behind him and you press F. I believe doing takes down, takedowns actually gives you back, like, life support or shield or something like that. It gives you their... some of their energy. Um, however, I will say that the combat in this game is incredibly easy. Almost entirely. There's a couple sections where it might be slightly challenging, but... Only very, very slightly. Overall, it's just incredibly easy, because your shield just regenerates. You just regenerate health when you're outside of combat, so... It's pretty easy, and then when, once you get the camouflage, which is coming in just a few minutes, really, and you have unlimited cover anywhere you want, just by pressing a button, it becomes very, very easy. So, like, using takedowns or, like, attempting to use stealth or something like that, no. In fact, there isn't even really a stealth system. Like, they don't hear, they don't have noise. Like, they can't hear noise from you. You can't hide in the shadows, uh, you can't use distractions. No, it's either they see you and they shoot at you, or they don't, and then you can use a takedown. So, it's, it's very simple combat. It feels pretty good, it's... Some of the combat controls are a little bit awkward. It feels too easy, but... The actual act of shooting stuff does feel really good, I'll say that. Very satisfying sounds, and satisfying reactions. Let's see, is there more combat to show over here? I don't believe so. No, I... Hmm... I guess I could show the camouflage. I could show... Alright, I'll show the camouflage. So. Actually, nah... No, never mind, I won't. <laughs> I don't want to reveal too much. I'm worried about spoilers at this point. Okay, so there's the combat. So... Yeah, the puzzles which make up the majority of the game, the more adventure game elements, they're, they're logical, but... They tend to be a bit silly. The combat feels pretty good, but it's kind of awkward. The character movement is also, it's pretty good. You know, WASD, jump to move. But on mouse and keyboard, it's... Doesn't feel perfect. It's a little bit awkward to move around. Controller works a bit better, but then... There's some sensitivity issues with that, and also it's harder to aim. And you can't adjust the sensitivity, so there's, there's a lot of general issues and, like, general polish... That I feel like this game could use. Uh, but once again, what I really like about it is its sci-fi setting and how it deals with AI, and how it deals with trying to reconcile all of these different operating parameters that quite often completely conflict. The desire to protect your pilot compared to the desire, or the the, the, the directive to uh, not lie, and stuff like that. And the conflicts that come up from that. It's very cool, and I think the art, even though it does suffer from some just simple usability issues of not being able to see what the hell you're looking at, it also looks really cool. It's creepy, it's really atmospheric. Yeah, I feel like they did a good job. There's some really nice, like, layering... ...that you can see going on. Um, what's it called? Parallax or whatever? When you move and stuff moves at a different rate because they're at different distances. Like here, you got this light, this light shaft and all these rocks in the ground, but then in the back you can see, like, trees and stuff, and then there's all these different layers of... ...particles coming down. It's really atmospheric looking. Very cool, and the soundtrack is quite nice. Like, in between combat sections, you generally hear these very kind of droning, creepy, atmospheric tracks. But during combat, uh, but during combat, you hear these more heart-pumping and more exciting tracks that sound really good. So it's great, and I just think the story is really cool. I don't want to spoil anything about it, so I don't want to talk too much about it. But again, it these issues of dealing with these different directives and how they conflict, and also just dealing with the, f the worry that you're malfunctioning. Because that's a worry. That's something Arid starts to worry about. She starts to worry that she's malfunctioning because she's trying to reconcile these things. She's going, she's going, what the hell's going on? You know, am I supposed to be doing this? Part of her, part of her saying yes. Part of her saying no. And she starts to worry that she's defective. And that becomes key to the story. I suppose it's kind of like someone losing their sanity, except the AI equivalent. When you, when it becomes less and less sure that it's actually operating properly, you know, operating within parameters. It's a very cool story, I just, I love it. I really like the story, I really like the atmospherics. I think the sound design is quite good. It's just, uh, it's a damn good game that has some, it's got some polish issues. I certainly could use more options in the options menu, no doubt about that. 
especially when it comes to the controls and sensitivity. But it's a really solid game, and I freaking love it because of the story. I really do love the story. It's so great. It's not something... It's just not something I see very often in games. I mean, I like dark, grim things. I like stories about artificial intelligences. And this is, well, exactly that. It's awesome. It's really awesome. Okay, so... Oh, yes, before I move... I was going to move on to the, uh, the spoiler stuff, but before I do that, I should mention, again, this game is made by Over the Moon, and it's available on Steam as well as the Humble Store, so I will have links in the description to all of that. So I'm going to move on to spoiler stuff now, so if you're going to tune out now, I just want to say thank you for watching. Hopefully you found this video informative. And yes, I am going to move on to spoiler territory, which is going to spoil the hell out of the story. So if you have any intention of playing this, or you think you even might, I would highly recommend that you stop watching now. Okay, ready for spoilers? Incoming spoilers. I'll say it a couple more times. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Okay. All right, let's talk about the end of the game. So something that I'd heard from... I just realized I'm doing, like, nothing in the background of the game. I'm just, like, walking back and forth and... <laughs> anyway. Um, something that I'd read from reviews of the game is that it ends very abruptly. And it actually does end in a to-be-continued. Which I feel like it was a bit of a mistake to actually say to-be-continued. But I guess I'll talk about that in a minute. So they're saying it ends abruptly. And I suppose it does, but... I don't feel like it ends so abruptly that it's a problem. Like, I didn't feel like that was an issue. In fact, I wouldn't even say it really had that abrupt of an ending. So here's what happened. In case you don't know. At the very beginning of the game, your mission is set out to be to protect the pilot within your suit. You're arid, you're in control of the suit, this combat suit, and you're supposed to protect your pilot. That's your, I suppose, your main mission. Yeah, actually, that's that's your objective. That's your main mission, is to protect your pilot inside of you. And you can't hear from this pilot, because Eric just assumes that the pilot is unconscious. If you look in here, you can see that the health monitor is damaged, so it's not too surprising that you wouldn't be able to, you know, look at their vital signs or whatever. And I just accepted it as fact that there's a pilot inside of me, and my mission is to protect them. And that's it, I never even questioned it. And neither did Arid. And when you get to the end of the game, it's revealed that you never had a pilot in you the entire time. There's no one to protect, you're empty. There's nothing inside of the suit. You're just an AI and that's it. And... I have a thing against twists. I normally don't like... Like, most of the time, I don't like twists at the end of something. Because I feel like they tend to feel cheesy. They tend to feel silly. And it's like, alright, whatever. You know, it's another M. Night Shyamalan, or however you pronounce his name. You know, twist. The obligatory twist. But I didn't feel that way with this. I think because it felt like a natural extension of the story. Because you're an AI that... Thinks it may be malfunctioning and isn't sure, and it's trying, it keeps kind of glitching out, and it's not sure how to uh, reconcile its, its reasoning with its missions and all that. Because of that, I felt like when I got to the end, I thought, oh, yeah, actually, why? If I'm malfunctioning, it totally makes sense that I would believe there's someone to protect, there's someone inside of me, but there actually isn't. Like, I just assumed that there was somebody inside of me, just as the AI did. Well, I suppose the AI believes it, doesn't just assume it, but it probably thinks it knows it, even though it's wrong because it's malfunctioning. But it just felt like a natural extension of the story. I thought, yeah, that made sense, actually. Given a malfunctioning AI, AI it makes sense that it would get something like that wrong. And that's one of the reasons I really love the ending the ending. It was a twist that actually felt good. Like it felt appropriate. Which is surprising to me, because most twists do not. 
And even though it did end in a to be continued, it honestly didn't feel like much of a cliffhanger. It felt like a natural endpoint to the story. It felt awesome. Like I was kind of in awe of the ending. I, f I thought it was really powerful. It surprised the hell out of me, but not in a cheesy way. Not in a, oh yeah, of course kind of way, but like, holy shit, wow. I thought it was a really, really good ending. A wonderful ending to the story and it totally made sense. It's the kind of ending that just makes me, made me think like, oh god, yeah, why didn't I think of that? Everything's going weird and I'm kind of malfunctioning. Why didn't I question the, the very first assumption that I had, which is that there's somebody inside me. There's somebody inside the suit, but there isn't. I thought it was wonderful. I just, I really like how they handled that. It felt, uh, it felt appropriate and just well written. Simple as that. Alright, well, that's all I wanted to talk about as far as spoilers are concerned, so I hope you enjoyed, and thank you for watching.